you by introducing you. Um, Richard Giragosian is the founding director of the Regional Study Centers, which is an independent think tank located in Yerevan. I know he has been very busy today. We wanted to, to discuss, of course, uh, the whole issue about Nagorno-Karabakh situation, the, the war which erupted again uh, in, in September last year, and which was quite interesting and perceived, because I would say that especially here in the West, I'm now here sitting in Vienna, nobody really saw that coming at that point, that this is going to escalate. So questions will be, why did it escalate? And uh, of course, also what role does Russia and, and Turkey especially play? So we also have Russia and Turkey um, experts here. And of course, also uh, Leila, who was born in Azerbaijan, is now living in London. So she will also then try to analyze, like maybe probably from her point of view. But um, I would like to start, of course, with uh, you, Richard, since uh, we all heard the news today. And my question would be, I mean, we heard that uh, Pashinyan was was asked by the military to step down, which he immediately called an attempted coup. And there was the war in, 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 in fall. And then there was this by Russia also a brokered ceasefire agreement, which mm -hmm. led to, to many yeah. protests because it was perceived by many Armenians also that uh, the coup, uh, that um, uh, Armenia was defeated in this war and they blame it on Pashinyan. And I guess their position also has a share in this. So my question to you, what is at stake today? for Armenia? What is at stake for the government? Um, why did it escalate? And, and what role does uh, did before and probably also the, the means process play, but also especially Russia and Turkey? And I leave it here because I think I already um, uh, mentioned uh, some very, very big issues. And please stick first to the 10 minutes so that we can engage in a, in a vivid uh, discussion. And I look forward to hear um, um, your stance on, on what is going on right now in uh, Armenia. Please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. It's also a pleasure to be back at Kadir Haas University, although I would have preferred physically in person. But it's also refreshing to rejoin my friends and colleagues on this panel. First of all, the title of this webinar is very much a struggle for dominance. I would argue, given events today in Armenia, the struggle for dominance is not just in the region. There is a struggle for dominance within Armenia itself. What we saw was an unprecedented development. The Armenian armed forces intervening directly in politics, the first time ever. The prime minister, in response, has labeled this a attempt at coup d'etat. I would beg to differ. Fortunately, there was no military deployment no movement of troops. <clears throat> Nevertheless, it represents a serious escalation of a pre-existing political crisis. And most significantly, the sheer fact that over three dozen senior military officers, including the chief of the general staff, issued an open call for the prime minister's resignation reveals a degree of dissent and discontent within the armed forces, which previously had always abstained from political developments. <clears throat> but let's look first at why this happened. In many ways, it reflects the fact that we are in unprecedented political territory. The Nagorno-Karabakh issue and the Karabakh conflict have erupted prior to statehood in Armenia. In both Armenia and Azerbaijan, the Karabakh conflict tended to shape and sometimes distort democratization and economic development. In the case of Armenia, the unexpected military defeat in the 44-day war over Nagorno-Karabakh represents a turning point in Armenian history. Pashinyan is the first leader of Armenia, the first Armenian government to have lost control of much of Nagorno-Karabakh. And the future is now very much in question and in doubt. At the same time, beyond the unchartered waters we now find ourselves in, we also see an assault of democratic institutions. Pashinyan and his government have garnered a rare legitimacy 
from truly free and fair elections after an impressive victory of nonviolent people power. These are now <clears throat> under assault. In many ways, Armenia as a struggling democracy is already under assault from COVID-19 and from rather reckless, impulsive leadership in the Pashinyan government. What we see, however, is in this political crisis, <clears throat> a failure of leadership, a lack of statesmanship, where Armenia today has no diplomatic strategy, no end state objectives with Azerbaijan or regarding Nagorno-Karabakh. Military defense reform is now already in deeper question, given the dissatisfaction of a disgruntled officer corps. And we do see <clears throat> a danger of missing opportunities, the restoration of trade and transport, the Russian peacekeeper deployment, which is now responsible for the safety and security of what's left of Nagorno-Karabakh, and a return to diplomacy, where much of the real struggle for dominance will now <clears throat> be manifested in the diplomatic arena. As you can see, I have more questions than I have answers. I do think the only way out of Armenia's lingering political crisis is through the necessity for new elections. Early elections where the government can secure a fresh mandate based on a reduced but working majority and a challenge for the opposition to propose alternatives. The opposition remains largely unpopular and deeply discredited and the paucity and poverty of the political discourse reflects the shock and the emotion of this post-war environment. The main driver for this lingering state of war is the failure to return all prisoners of war and civilian hostages. Azerbaijan and its government is using the issue for political gain and dividend to shore up its position diplomatically. But I do think that, ironically, the position of Russia is very productive and constructive in issuing a call for calm and renouncing any idea of a military coup within Armenia. At the same time, although an early election is the only legal constitutional way forward, the outlook remains vague and unclarified regarding Nagorno-Karabakh, regarding Armenia's relations with its neighbors, regarding the restoration of trade and transport. Therefore, there are two areas of progress I want to highlight. The first is a back-channel line of diplomatic engagement between Armenia and Azerbaijan through the heads of the national security services of both countries. And second, the deputy prime ministers of Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Russia have been garnering progress in working groups devoted to the practical implementation of the Russian agreement regarding the restoration of trade, transport, road, and rail. This is a unique opportunity for even Armenia to emerge as a transit state and for the region as a whole to face economic recovery from COVID-19 with a fresh start at reintegration. But much remains unclear. And in conclusion, the only thing we can say is there is no conclusion. This is a very dynamic process. Much of the attention today on Armenia reveals much deeper deficiencies throughout the region. The outlook for stability in both Azerbaijan and Armenia are questioned. And in many ways, much of our discussion this evening will focus on scenarios, opportunities, and challenges. So let me stop here and also uh, look for more insight from my colleagues.
Thank you very much, uh, Richard, for your for your remarks. I mean, you said it's a struggle for dominance not only in the region but also within Armenia. And you say that probably a way out could be new elections to give a new and a fresh mandate, but also that diplomatic engagement between Armenia and Azerbaijan would be necessary. We know that this is probably not easy considering the recent events also, and probably also what Aliyev already stated. But I would now like to 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 go to Leila Aliyeva. I'm very happy to see you again. Uh, last time I think we we saw each other. In person here in Vienna. I hope that this will happen again. Uh, Leila Aljeva is uh, from the Oxford School for Global and Area Studies. And I think you're not going really to, to, to give now the, the typical Azerbaijani position. But I mean, I think it is very important also to, to understand like what lies behind the, the conflict actually between Armenia and Azerbaijan. I mean, it's not really a new conflict. It, it goes back to Soviet times, maybe probably even longer before to, to the First World War. But my question will be like, uh, of course, also your stance on probably what is going on now within Armenia. What does this mean for, for, for the conflict? What does it mean for, for the peace? Uh, it's an uneasy peace. It was an uneasy peace. But also, I mean, um, um, what is the narrative within Azerbaijan? What role do these uh, outside factors play, namely Russia and Turkey, which we are going to have a focus later later onwards? But but what are also those those unresolved issues uh, from the past? Um, Leila, um, the floor is yours, and please be free, of course, also to to um, comment on 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 what um, Richard has been saying or what the others are going to to say later. Um, you need to to turn on your mic. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure also to see all of you and to see my old friends and colleagues here. Um, I would like to start with the uh, idea that we're going through very sort of stormy period now. If you look at Armenia and what's happening in Georgia, Azerbaijan just went through this period, but I think the uh, possible instability was redirected towards uh, the military action. Uh, we do, um, however, uh, understand that there were a lot of unfinished business since early 90s, and uh, it was not really addressed. The problem is that the military actions, the war was waged within the internationally recognized uh, borders of Azerbaijan, within the territory of Azerbaijan. And uh, the main issue uh, for Azerbaijan, the displacement of 700,000 people from their own homes was never addressed, although there was a legal sort of foundation for that. And uh, one of the reasons uh, why uh, we have what we have now is the normative uncertainty which was created as a result of the, on the one hand, the uh, some multilateral institutions as the UN adopting uh, resolutions on withdrawal of troops and delegitimizing the military way of resolution of the conflict on the one hand. And on the other hand, you had the other format of the Minsk group, which was actually legitimizing the military gains. So as a result, you know, you had a status quo conserved and none of the parties were really interested in resolving it, there was little interest from the uh, euro because of the periphery, and there were many other issues going on. So there was not vested interest in basically pushing the countries towards the uh, resolution, um, the conf conflict. So the status quo was more or less uh, satisfactory from, uh, from the point of view of most of the actors. And it should have been uh, sort of exploded one day because the pressure of the unresolved humanitarian emergency, which uh, I already described, would be a big pressure on any political leader who was in Azerbaijan. Um, I think that the other uh, reason why it happened was the sort of almost tectonic uh, change or attempt of tectonic change which was um, actually uh, taking place, took place in Armenia in, 19, uh, in 2018. Because what I think Pashinyan tried to do, he tried to reverse almost 200 years long uh, logic of the uh, geopolitical sort of uh, dependencies in the region and try to get away from the political influence of Russia. And that definitely sort of shaken 
the major uh, sort of power centers and uh, evolved some fears and anxieties. Um, uh, there were some hopes on Azerbaijani side that um, this liberalization of our environment by Pashinyan um, in domestic politics will be extended to the security paradigm, but it didn't happen. So the security par paradigm was not revised. And uh, I think that's what happened eventually because uh, we ended up with the increasing nationalist rhetoric and um, uh, which led us together with the growing independent role of Turkey um, and in general, the COVID, which uh, seems to be correlated with a higher uh, level of instability worldwide. Uh, it was... Um, uh, sort of observed that in 2020, the um, number of social unrests and protests increased uh, 70% worldwide uh, during the COVID year. So um, I think all these contributed, of course, and um, we had, and it was quite uh, unexpected for even Azerbaijani public that it's going to happen. Um, uh, the the major narrative in Azerbaijan is probably our two. First of all, uh, they're happy that uh, the uh, justice has been restored. The uh, 700,000 refugees managed to come back to their homes and it's all within the internationally uh, recognized borders. So there is nothing which Azerbaijan was violating in terms of international law. But the other narrative was probably shock from discovering the negative reaction in Europe, in European public opinion. And I think that was a very serious uh, discovery in Azerbaijan of what they perceived as religious Europe. Because if you look at that, that uh, sort of uh, uh, revealed the attitudes uh, of many um and in the West, and I think it's partly due to the rise of liberalism, and that's why civilizational discourse uh, was sort of uh, finding a fertile ground in, um, in the West uh, as a result of this um, uh, eruption of conflict celebration of return of the uh, refugees or IDPs to their place on the one hand and the alarms on the other uh, in the West uh, who cared about preservation of the Christian monuments and things like that. So I think that caused quite a serious disappointment in the possibility of the of Europe, of the West, to be a neutral broker, uh, to be an objective one, even from the point of view of the, as was perceived, a selective application of the uh, norms, international norms and um, rights, uh, human rights principles to the various groups depending on their ethnic or confessional background. So that was the perception and the... Um, I would conclude with the fact that the most uh, probably worrying um, element is a general negative attitude to Russian uh, troops in the region, in the in the ground. Um, I think Russian troops have different environment as compared to the all other secessionist conflicts in Georgia or in. Um, uh, Moldova, because there is practically no ground, so in, socially speaking, for the uh, uh, Russian uh, perception of Russian troops in the country. It's very negative. Uh, almost daily, people voice they protest, um, uh, expressed in the uh, internet and Facebook. And I think uh, this might be source of. Uh, the instability in uh, the country uh, as one of the uh, major reasons uh, for uh, dissatisfaction with the outcome of the war. 
Thank you very much, uh, Leila. Very interesting points. And I think it's also important to, to raise also, you know, the refugees, the humanitarian situation, a war always has uh, humanitarian consequences. And it's always important to note that our next speaker, since you also mentioned that this can be like uh, one of uh, the biggest problems, also this negative attitude to Russian troops, also brings us to Russia. And I would like to welcome Sergei Markedonov. Uh, he's the leading researcher at the um, Gimo Institute for International Studies and editor-in-chief of the Journal of International Analytics, Moscow. Nice to see you. I'm happy to see you again, uh, healthy, uh, Sergei. Probably also on what you have been hearing already. I mean, we know that uh, Moscow, especially Russia, in, in, the, in the conflict in uh, last year uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan, actually managed in the in the end to broker this uh, so-called ceasefire agreement. Nevertheless, I mean, uh, Russia, post-Soviet Russia, let's call it like that, always has its ambitions um, in 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 these um, in its former Soviet areas, neighborhoods, let's call, and in, especially also in the frozen conflict. So uh, interestingly, now he presented itself as a mediator, but also when it comes then to Armenia, Armenia now after losing the war, it seems to be quite also um, um, dependent on Russia when it comes to security. So my question would be like, how uh, um, did Russia, I mean, what did Russia actually bring in? Like, what does it want in the region? Like, what is its interest there? And of course, also, please feel free on, on, on commenting on what Richard has been saying or what Leila has been saying, also in light of what was going on uh, with Armenia. I know that Russia already said it's uh, it's concerned of what is going on, but it's an internal conflict. So, so please, Sergei, the next 10 minutes, uh, the floor is yours. And voila. Stephanie, thank you so much. Uh, let me express my gratitude to you and Dimitrios for inviting me here for this uh, panel. Uh, and uh, of course, I am more than glad to see uh, some of my good friends and colleagues after a long time break and hope the next time we will have uh, direct communication, not virtual one. Um, you raised a lot of uh, questions. Uh, the first one, what does Russia want in the region, in the or solid space in general, and how can we uh, estimate the role of Russia? Uh, first of all, uh, speaking about some general things, uh, Russia uh, takes a special concern about uh, South Caucasus and for Soviet space because many problems uh, appearing in the newly independent countries are connected with Russian domestic security reasons, especially North Caucasus as well as South Caucasus. They are connected in many ways. Uh, some more general things. Uh, Russia is uh, interested to uh, see uh, Eurasian security as an exclusive model with no external counterweights, like United States, NATO, and so on. They are not part of Eurasia, but they try to predict, to define the agenda. This is why for Russia it's necessary to cooperate with other Eurasian giants like Turkey and Iran, having uh, of, uh, a, a lot of uh, problems in our uh, relationship. We are not strategic allies, but at the same time, we cooperated previously in Syrian direction, in the Middle Eastern agenda also. And uh, as for um, some other re reasons, uh, Russia is interested to see more or less predictable and secure environment, uh, neighborhood. Because uh, usually Russia is portrayed like kind of unique power uh, trying to dominant to be dominant in neighborhood area, but it's typical. I'm not uh, going to compare our policies with the United States and kind of, kind of conventional wisdom to do it. Let's compare Russian policies with Turkish one, Iranian, Indian, Chinese, Pakistani, and so on and so on. All of those countries based in Eurasia are taking care about their um, <clears throat> neighborhood. As for Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, uh, let me uh, first of all uh, pay attention to some uh, differences uh, between this conflict and some other ones. Uh, Leila mentioned Georgia, mentioned Moldova, and so on. First of all, uh, okay, I agree with uh, some uh, posts uh, in uh, social networks about dissatisfaction with Russian presence, but uh, those guys uh, are not... Uh, uh, manifestation of the official foreign policy. Let's follow statements of uh, President of Azerbaijan, which is rather satisfied, not by Russian presence, but the results of the second warfare and the role of Russia there, balanced between two conflicting powers, because uh, Russia did the same in Georgia and Moldova, by the way. The problem that some uh, countries uh, suffered from secessionist conflicts 
or uh, thinking about uh, their problems, how to uh, regain control over secessionist area, tries to uh, try to uh, break status quo, ignoring Russian interests. With no it, uh, Russia didn't uh, do when it did in Georgia in 2008 or in uh, some other areas. In the case of Nagorno-Karabakh, both conflict in parties, Armenia and Azerbaijan, were interested in the Russian presence as facilitator and mediator. It took place prior to 2020 events and after. Here are no principal differences. Prior to the Second Karabakh War in Hamaliv, Pashinyan, and some other Armenian leaders who replaced each other uh, said the same things. Yeah, we are interested to see Russia like mediator. Of course, Yerevan and Baku uh, considered the perspectives of this uh, conflict resolution in different ways. They perceived Russia's role in different ways, yeah. But they have one common point. The situation was similar in Georgia prior to 2004, not after or uh, in uh, some extent in Moldova. As for uh, other uh, differences and commonalities, uh, this Nagorno-Karabakh conflict uh, was less geopolitical one, because practically every conflict in the post-Soviet space transformed from ethnopolitical, connected with the results of collapse of uh, previously United country uh, to geopolitical with uh, external engagement. And uh, conflict of uh, Abkhazia and Georgia now is, mm, cannot be perceived like problems between Suhumi and Skinwali. They are about NATO, NATO enlargement, problem of rivalry between US and uh, Russia and so on. The Nagorno-Karabakh conflict for a long time was not perceived in this geopolitical format. Because for Russia, it was not about NATO enlargement. For the West, it was not connected with Russia's revisionism because Russia didn't uh, change borders in around Karabakh. This is why it was a little bit apart. It was not a piece of this rivalry between the West and Russia. Uh, it uh, gives uh, Moscow space for maneuver because lost uh, control over Georgia in 2008, Russia uh, was not interested and is not interested now to see Azerbaijan like second Georgia but the second Georgia with uh, a bigger potential, with strong connections with Turkey, with, uh, and this is why this uh, problem will be accompanied potentially with a lot of risks. This is why Russia balanced. It was not discovery of 2020 events. And now it's necessary to pay attention to one very important point, by the way, uh, problem of perception of Karabakh, Armenia, occupied areas in Armenia and outside of it. Because for Armenian politicians, be them opponents of power or in power, prior to 2020, Nagorno-Karabakh and properly Armenian occupied areas were the parts of the same set, a complex of security issues. They were, uh, I would say, in, uh, uh, indivisible. As for Russia, uh, they were, uh, and they, they are now uh, three different sets of the problems. Armenia and guarantees for its security, then Nagorno-Karabakh and problems of its status and occupation. Because uh, the problem of Nagorno-Karabakh has consisted of two baskets, but the two parties stress only on one basket, Azerbaijan on occupation and Armenia on status. But the complexity of this problem is coexistence of the two baskets problem of occupation of areas not connected with Nagorno-Karabakh, claims of Armenian community to reconsider its status, and problem of status, provoking this conflict in the late of the Soviet time. It's necessary to understand. It helps us to explain the position of Russia in the Second Karabakh War, because it was kind of paradox when people who admired the immediate reaction of Russia in 2008 and 2000. Uh, 14 uh, were disappointed in Russian, I would say, passive reaction in 2020. It's kind of paradox. They, they, they waited that Russia will maybe attack Azerbaijan or maybe even Turkey immediately, but Russia did not do it, uh, chosen the other way. I suppose the most important lessons for Russia and for evaluation of Russian 
behavior outside of our country uh, from this second Nagorno-Karabakh war. First of all, this uh, conflict did not discover but sharpened the absence of universal recipe in Russian approach to the conflict resolution. Russia is not going to replicate the Setian case to Nagorno-Karabakh and Nagorno-Karabakh to Crimea and Crimea to Donbass. There is a variety of different issues predetermined by various <coughs> bilateral uh, relations dynamics, uh, relations between uh, newly independent countries and Russia, Western Russia, and so on and so on. And the other problem, uh, uh, no universal recipe and no specific anti-Westernism or Turkophobia or Iranian phobia and, and so on in Russia. Because uh, is Russia happy to see Turkey and Azerbaijan? Of course not. Of course not. Uh, I'm honest. Russia would prefer to play exclusive role in the region. But we have what we have. Their politics is an art of opportunities. This is why we should cooperate to uh, keep, to uh, retain our uh, role. Role is so important. And it's interesting that other two co-chairs of Minsk OEC group agreed on this leading dominant role of Russia in the conflict resolution and then in a promotion of uh, regional economy repair and restoration. It's so important. Because Russia was the only country who offered this idea how to revitalize the uh, economic ties between the two countries, how to overcome problems and some deadlocks. I'm not so naive believing that all those ideas uh, registered in uh, January summit in Moscow will be realized very fast. No, but uh, it's, it's a chance. This chance could be lost, this chance could be realized and reached. It, it's, it depends on many factors. Domestic stability and security in Armenia, uh, situation uh, in and around uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, situation in Nagorno-Karabakh itself, because Russian peacekeepers were deployed for the period of five years. All those conditions were absent in the case of Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Transnistria. This is why, hypothetically, we can face some at least collision, at least maybe points of disputes in triangle Turkey, Russia, Azerbaijan. And uh, of course, uh, I'm not so naive to believe that the game of the West is over because for United States, any uh, activities in Eurasia with no American approval are usually treated as a challenge. Now we see three Eurasian giants, Turkey, Russia, Iran. All of them have uh, ambiguous, at least, relationship with the West and especially with US. And they try to reorganize new status quo after 2020 events. This is why I suppose we can uh, follow the promise of Mr. Biden to see the great return of the United States. Maybe this return in the South Caucasus would not be so great. It's uh, dependent on many circumstances, but uh, the game is not over, by the way. And Russia is uh, hoping to play its role as one of the uh, most important actors in the region. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Sergei, for, for your contribution. And uh, thank you also for being quite quite blunt and also bringing up, of course, the geopolitical component, but of course also the, the different and quite interesting relationship between Russia and, and Turkey, especially also when it comes not only to the to the Caucasus, but of course we are also uh, speaking about the Middle East. And before we go to, to meet that, maybe just uh, shortly again, encouraging all the participants, if you have questions, please submit them below. And now uh, I would like um, to welcome Mita Chalikpala. Nice to see you again. Um, he's the Professor of International Relations and the Vice Rector of the Kadir Haas University in Istanbul. Uh, it's nice to see you again. Um, my question to you would be also, of course, following up on what Sergey and Leila and, and Richard have been saying. But I mean, we speak about Turkey now being, being quite close to Azerbaijan. And, and the question is like, can its involvement in the conflict actually be portrayed as Ankara's growing role in the strategically important South Caucasus? And then, of course, um, what does Turkey actually really gain? And 
And how is the relationship between Russia and, and Turkey, which is often uh, also called as something like a cooperative uh, competition, which is quite interesting since they are um, competitors, I would say, in the Middle East. I mean, there is not so so blunt, but when it comes now to do what was happening in the Caucasus, they actually managed at one point, at least to broker the ceasefire, to be not to, to not lead to further escalation. But of course, also feel free to to discuss uh, what what the others have been saying, also in light of um, what is going on in Armenia today. The floor yeah. is yours, Rita. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. It's also my pleasure uh, to be with you, uh, with my colleagues and friends, of course, discuss this issue and I also would like to start with in fact Richard's conclusion conclusion is there is no conclusion he said yes that's true uh, because it's a very dynamic process and we have different processes within and uh, in between the region and region related with the other uh, sub regions and this is true I agree also with the, the idea that uh, the Caucasus is now linked with not only with the Black Sea but the Middle East as well Turkey's Iran's and of course Russia's involvement uh, within the region makes everything much more interrelated with each other and therefore it's not easy to, to make analysis without uh, giving any attention to the other region. Uh, how can I start? For, from Turkish point of view, of course, there is a kind of uh, a, a, a fighting, uh, following the latest fighting uh, or the 45 or 44 days of war over Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, a kind of a deal or ceasefire has signed, and it is a very positive from Turkish view of perspective, at least, uh, that Azerbaijan has retaken control all over uh, all seven liberated districts around Karabakh that had been occupied by uh, Armenian forces since the early 1990s. This was one of those impediments or, or limitations from Turkey's perspective to normalize its relations with all the Caucasian countries. Therefore, the, this is uh, resettled at result from one point uh, at least. And afterwards, Azerbaijani forces also regained a large territory in parts of Nagorno-Karabakh itself. Uh, what makes Azerbaijan happy and, and, and satisfied uh, from uh, this perspective makes Turkey also satisfied. And this is a, a starting point from Turkish uh, view of uh, the region and what's happening. And there is a kind of a Russian brokered ceasefire deal. Uh, and it, according to the ceasefire, Russia uh, has seen the deployment of nearly 2,000 uh, Russian peacekeepers, let's say, to ensure security in, in the enclave. Uh, and it is uh, only a overlanding with Armenia. This is so-called Lachin Kordo through south, south uh, western Azerbaijan. But on the other hand, there is a, uh, for the first time, there is a Turkish uh, patrols working and, and active, uh, legally activating their, their, their presence in, in the Caucasus in Azerbaijan. And this is a kind of a balancer from Turkish point of view as well. Uh, and we have a ceasefire and truce, as Richard mentioned, but we are very far from a political agreement, uh, especially regarding the question of the status of Karabakh. As far as the Azerbaijani side is concerned, let, I can easily say that uh, Karabakh is now off the table, at least status issue is off the table. Uh, it is no longer up for discussion, uh, so it will be very difficult, I think, to talk about the territorial autonomy of Nagorno-Karabakh anymore, but there is still need to have some uh, set of negotiations about the future normalization of relations between Azerbaijan and Armenia, of course, between Turkey and uh, Armenia, uh, and a kind of a normal uh, region within the Caucasus as well. Uh, at the end, after a couple of months, the, the, the last uh, autumn and, of course, winter, I can easily say that there is a, a new status quo and a political or geopolitical map in the Caucasus. And this is a reality or new reality of the region. Uh, and the situation has changed bo both literally and figuratively. There is no question on this uh, perspective, I, I, I think. And we have a new strategic uh, context, a new narrative, and, of course, a new regional context, this might be a tri trilateral or regional context uh, with the merger of the region's geopolitics with the Black Sea, as our title mentioned or suggested, or the Middle East. Therefore, we have to think much broader perspective. Within this uh, equation, uh, I may agree with Sergey that there is no uh, Western or international uh, forces or institutions in the region. 
uh, erosion of international law and institutions, especially OSC broker negotiations or diplomacy failed. And the MIST group has suffered a lot of reputational damage in the region. Uh, and beyond that, we have some uh, actors, particularly France, for example, uh, in Azerbaijan, in Turkey, or maybe in the region, they lost uh, their honest mediator uh, role or reputation, and they have no such a kind of a role in the region. Maybe what's happening in, the, in today in Yerevan, only Turkey and Russia initially very active to take uh, part and to, to make some comments uh, what's hap- regarding what's happening in Yerevan. Uh, it's still, uh, up to that mo- moment, uh, Europeans are just observing what's going on, maybe the U.S. as well. And uh, there is a new balance, as I said, and uh, a balance of power, let me say, in the region. And Turkey is in the equation, even militarily. And maybe this is the new thing. Uh, Beforehand, there was always Turkey, uh, at least Turkey's story within the region as well, together with Azerbaijan. But now we see Turkey active in the region with its military force. It is a more visible and assertive uh, actor in the Caucasus. And most probably the Turkish support is the key to understand the strategic timing of Azerbaijani attack and the, 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 the how can I say, uh, the success as well uh, on, on the field. Uh, it's very easy. Ankara remains Baku's key military ally and Turkey is already supporting Azerbaijan militarily through technical assistance, through arms sales, providing critical military support, especially in terms of armed drones and technical expertise. And these are very important developments, at least when you are looking at the issue from Ankara's perspective. And it seems that Russia is is fine with that, at least up to that moment. As Sergei mentioned, most probably Moscow is not fond of to see Turkey actively on the field, but maybe Turkey is much more acceptable or or, uh, it's easily uh, more welcome for Russia or Moscow uh, than Europeans or American involvement in all those issues, because the parties have uh, much more different interests in different issues and regions from the Black Sea to the Middle East and to the Caucasus as well. But time to time, they, they manage to get together and on the table, they may not negotiate some issues. And this is also important to understand the struggle of dominance within the region as well. Uh, but I don't know, of course, in the coming future or near future, whether Russia... Uh, and Turkey get together with the consent of Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia to have a much more uh, cooperative Caucasus to be part of much broader Caucasus, uh, Black Sea, or the Middle East. I don't know yet. There are no sign of it. There is a competition between Moscow and Ankara. But these developments are new phenomena after 30 years or 20, 20, 25 years. And we had to think twice. And... I don't know as well what will happen uh, Turkey's military existence in the region, whether the parties manage to transform their involvement with the region from the military involvement to political and then the trade-wise or or economy-wise developments. There is a potential there, and many people were discussing, and we uh, we do the same stuff in, in Turkey as well. How can, if it is possible to have some links, for example, this Turkey, Georgia, or Azerbaijan link together with the, the Trans-Caspian uh, linking the region towards uh, the east, east to ch- up to China, uh, from Brussels to up to China, let me say. Or is there a possibility to have another link uh, to have Armenia, Azerbaijan, Turkey, all those actors? We will see, but the key in, in all those equations, it's most probably uh, Armenia. Uh, I, I was in a different meeting with Richard and other colleagues as well, in, in, in all those meetings as well. I was defending that what what the role for the West is to, to find some means and ways to bring Turkey and, and Armenia together, to bring Armenia and Azerbaijan together to discuss some issues, to create some much more friendly and productive environment to look future much, I don't know, constructively. Now, what's happening in Armenia is important. We do not have a chance to see Yerevan or or Armenia as a failed state or weak state. Uh, We have to work on this issue. This is the reason most probably why Ankara is very quick to say that it's very important to have a democratically elected government to be in power in, in Yerevan. 
Uh, therefore, there is a kind of a Russian imposed ceasefire now, but it is just the beginning. The war diplomacy is uh, or war of diplomacy is on the table. We have to concentrate on on this issue. Uh, we may work together. Uh, we may have some some extra roles, but I think we are going to see much more aggressive and active Turkey, not only in in Baku but in in general in the Caucasus as well. Let me stop here, Stephanie. Depending on the questions and comments, I may try to. Uh, clarify my, my perspective as well. Thank you very much. Uh, I would suggest that we go the same order since uh, Richard needs to leave them pretty soon. Of course, please feel free also to comment on what has been uh, said before. There are already also questions coming in, but I also would like to hear from you still uh, a little bit also about the civil society in Armenia now when it comes to the conflict. How do they approach the whole situation? And also the diaspora. I think Armenia has one of the biggest diasporas in the world. I mean, what role did the diaspora play beforehand in the conflict? Like, how is it involved? Is it involved at all? Uh, on what levels? And then, of course, um, please feel free to comment on what Leila said since you were uh, the first <coughs> one speaking. So, so the floor is yours, please. Well, thank you very much, Stephanie. And thank you to my colleagues for actually sparking a more insightful uh, discussion. Uh, first of all, regarding the Armenian diaspora, what's interesting is one of the outcomes from the war has been a graduation to a more sophisticated approach and perspective by the global Armenian diaspora. It is where democracy, economic development is much more important than ever before on equal status with genocide recognition and the Karabakh. This is a belated development, but a fortunate, positive graduation and a more sophisticated approach. Whether the Armenian government can harness or meet that, we don't yet know. Secondly, in terms of civil society, there's a danger in this post-war environment of a return to apathy after successful gains from activism. And I am a little bit worried where the honeymoon period of the Armenian government is long gone. And there is added economic pressure on top of the political crisis that's only going to get worse, exacerbated by the economic challenge of recovery from COVID-19. Because one important thing, Armenia and Azerbaijan were already at war well before September. It was a war against the coronavirus. We shouldn't take our eyes off the ball in terms of a public health crisis. But I am a little bit concerned as we return to diplomacy regarding the Minsk group, the mediation, the Gorno Karabakh. I'm a little concerned that if left unchallenged, there's a dangerous precedent from the outcome of the war. The danger is a precedent that tends to show that there is a military solution to an essentially political diplomatic conflict. That's a dangerous precedent for Crimea as much as Nagorno-Karabakh. And I am worried that it tends to justify might makes right, the use of force. I'm also a little bit worried about democracy being undermined in terms of the context of the perception of the war for Nagorno-Karabakh being an assault and attack from authoritarian Azerbaijan on a struggling democracy. This undermines Armenia's embrace and commitment to democratic institutions, and it pushes Armenia ever more firmly into a Russian orbit. In terms of the broader outlook, I do expect a return of the United States and the European Union, but there's an opportunity here. There's a convergence of interests between Moscow, Brussels, and Washington in post-war stability, in ensuring that there is no danger of renewed hostilities. The Biden administration can actually work with the Putin leadership in Russia because this is the one area where Russia has been working with the West and not against the West within the Minsk group. 
And there is a foundation for a convergence of interest. At the same time, Turkey has an opportunity in terms of the outlook for normalizing relations with Armenia, overcoming exclusion and isolation. And in a way, there is an opportunity inherent in this crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I see Leila seems to uh, be left. So maybe we just, I already go to the question. Of course, Sergei, you can also comment on what was said before. But I mean, there is also a question I would say, which uh, is for you. So that the question would be... Um, I'm actually other, back. Are you back? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but maybe I, I posed the question to Sergei, but then I come, okay. come back. Yeah. Okay. So the question would be, um, what are the further regional implications for Moldova and Georgia? Like, how would a final solution of these conflicts could look like? <laughs> If I would know the final solution of this conflict, I was awarded the Nobel Prize for peace. <laughs> But uh, frankly speaking, what can we see now? Uh, I can uh, a little bit sharpen the idea of Mitat and continue his thesis about uh, uh, maybe approaching of uh, Middle East or a uh, wider Black Sea area to the Caucasus agenda. First of all, we see the strengthening of uh, other uh, geopolitical options than rivalry competition between the West and Russia. A lot of elements looking like Middle Eastern agenda are replicating now in the Caucasus, like concert between uh, Eurasian giants who are not allies, who are not uh, competitors at the same time. Neither alliance, nor confrontation, Turkey, Russia, and Iran. The growing religious factor, prior to 2020, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict was perceived like absolutely not connected with religious factor. It was perceived like ethnopolitical, classical ethnopolitical post-Soviet conflict. Now we see the role of religious factor grown. Of course, it will take more time to understand the real role of uh, Middle Eastern rebels, uh, Uh, real influence of them and so on, because it's a kind of speculations for mass media uh, sensations and so on and so on. But nevertheless, it, it, it's a factor. It's not coincidence that Iran pays special attention to it. The role of Iran has grown, because previously uh, South Caucasus was a rather marginal topic in the Iranian agenda. Uh, it uh, concentrates on the Middle East, first of all, on the Persian Gulf. Now, from time to time, from day to day, Iran frequently addressed to the problem of security, its uh, northern borders and so on. One more point, one more puzzle, very interesting in this regional context. No uh, strict correspondence of usual uh, divisions. Let's see on NATO, for example. NATO in the South Caucasus now. Is Turkey a NATO member? Yes. Can we say that interest of Turkey correspond to interest of France? One more NATO member. No, absolutely. Can we say that interests of United States and Turkey are identical? No, absolutely. In some elements, interests of NATO members like France and uh, United States are closer to Russia and Iran because all those countries are interested in balance between conflicting parties while Turkey concentrates on one-sided support of Azerbaijan. For Turkey, there is no agenda how to balance between Armenia and Azerbaijan. For Russia, yes, for Turkey, no. This is why we see a lot of puzzles uh, witnessing on internationalization of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and uh, maybe approaching of many elements of Middle Eastern agenda to the Caucasus. Because uh, this co uh, conflict will uh, have uh, consequences on uh, societies of the two conflicting parties and Georgia also. Religious factor and the uh, role of Turkey, Azerbaijan in economy and political life of Georgia will also uh, contribute to the re-evaluation of its role for strengthening of requests for NATO and uh, some other points. This is why we see serious transformation. Only one point I can uh, not disagree completely, but partly with Mitat, who said that uh, status issue now is uh, not on the table. Uh, it's Yes and no at the same time. Because, uh, yes, this question was not uh, written in the uh, joint uh, ceasefire statement. It was absent in a, a document uh, signed in January 2021 in Moscow. 
But at the same time, pay attention to statements of uh, Sergei Lavrov and Vladimir Putin on the status, who said that this issue should be delayed. It would be resolved by uh, under new conditions when the two conflicting parties will find the will to uh, find compromise, concession on this topic, and so on and so on. And it's not coincidence that Russia became much more active prior to the assault of Stepanakert, what Leila said previously. The results of the war are not satisfied for maybe many, but some, some portion of the Azerbaijani population, it's clear, for some portion. Maybe not for many, for most, but for some, because no adequate sociological polls how to evaluate those opinions. But they exist, it's, it's clear. Uh, it's, it's not coincidence also. Because for Russia, the replication of uh, Serbian Ukraine scenario in the Caucasus soil was not appropriate. This is why, yes, of course, this issue is not uh, topic number one, but at the same time, it exists. Thank you very much, uh, Sergei. Leila, let's come, let, let me come back to you. I mean, you were the second person uh, speaking. Please feel free, of course, also to, to comment on what Sergei and, and Mita have been saying. But also, I mean, uh, Richard brought it up, Sergei and Mita as well, is also this absence of the US and the absence of uh, of the European Union when it comes to, to the Caucasus region, especially last year. I mean, we know the US was very occupied also with the election of the president there. So this might be one of the reasons. But um, what would you say uh, um, about the, the European Union role in this conflict? And then there's also already a question for you. Um, where Heidi Gura asks them, um, what was the price Azerbaijan paid to Russia uh, for its supportive stance during or at the beginning of the war? Please, the floor is yours. Uh, I, I want to apologize in advance because my internet connection is very poor, so I didn't hear all your questions, but I will try at least to uh, address some of them and also some questions were in the which are in the chat I would like to respond to uh, but it's related also to the question in the chat uh, to Sergey about the uh, these guys in social networks I would say you underestimate attitude to sense of Russian troops what happened 30 years after is a major deviation from the very concept of the independent the state um, of Azerbaijan. It looks like I'm, I'm cut. Um, and um, I would like, do you hear me? Did you hear me? Did we you can hear, hear me? you, yes, yes. Uh, so I, um, yeah. So uh, this is major deviation, as I said, from the very substance of the Azerbaijani modern nation state. No presence of the foreign troops and Russian troops, first of all, uh, and it's a quite a strong tradition for hundred years, which was there um, in uh, every time when the modern nation state was restored or it was. So uh, this major deviation creates a serious risks for the future stability and development, not only in Azerbaijan, but in general in the region. Um, uh, the, uh, there is a small group in power who supports the presence of the Russian troops because this is the substance of their survival strategy, regime survival strategy to balance between regional actors. First of all, Turkey did not get its place in arrangements and many see uh, Turkey as insufficient actor in the peacekeeping. Uh, second, there is uh, definitely a uh, growing dissatisfaction with Russia exceeding its uh, Russia peacekeepers, exceeding its limits of what it's supposed to do. And by definition, Azerbaijani uh, public considers that it is there to uh, help to consolidate the sovereignty of Azerbaijan and control over uh, the territory within the internationally recognized borders. What's happening in the ground, it's totally opposite. 
So uh, Russian peacekeepers behave as this is a, a small uh, branch of Kremlin there. Uh, they uh, totally ignore the Azerbaijani government when they uh, communicate or bring or where the uh, officials from Armenia come to Karabakh. So there is a very growing, uh, very seriously growing dis uh, dissatisfaction with Russian peacekeeping forces. And unless Russian peacekeepers change seriously their behavior, so the, uh, uh, the Azerbaijani government uh, and the rest would be uh, uh, would be sure that they are there to support the uh, the uh, not to violate the sovereignty of Azerbaijani state, then it might be as <laughs> serving the peace. But otherwise, it's uh, there is a lot of concerns, and also the uh, recently the adopted decree of uh, Armenians of Karabakh that uh, Russia will be the second official language for some reasons. And so everyone expects that there might be other developments like uh, distribution of Russian passports and the scenario which is very similar to the others. So this is uh, sort of my concern. The European Union, I think that uh, probably because it's a periphery, but EU and in general Minsk group, the Western actors did not did not act as normative uh, actors in the region. And that's the major problem. So, uh, and that's why this gap in the region was filled by the patron-client relationship with the regional actors. So EU uh, or um, US, they did not empower uh, US to a greater degree, I would say, than EU, but you uh, were Europe did not empower the sense of uh, the countries as uh, independent subjects of international relations. It did not promote the sense of uh, interdependency rather than dependency. So it would act rather like a civilizational savior or like a patron, but never as a normative actor. We need transitional justice. We need the uh, grievances to be redressed. None of the international organizations took this function uh, and didn't uh, didn't uh, fulfill it. So uh, I, I think, uh, I'm sorry that uh, Richard left, but he said something and I, I'm not sure I got the idea what the result of the war was. But the war had, I think, double effect in Armenian society. On the one hand, probably it brought a bit more realism and uh, effect of uh, that military is not going to resolve the issue. You can't have an endless wars with your neighbors for territories. I mean, this is not going to end well. So what you have to do instead that start to normalize relationship with respect of their borders, with the respect of sovereignty, and then develop normal normal economic relationship for the common good. So I'll tell you, there is a quite a serious uh, trend in uh, in Armenia there, as well as in Azerbaijan. So there are interesting uh, initiatives at the grassroots level in the uh, right now. There are dialogues, direct dialogues, uh, streams between Armenia and Azerbaijanis. And it's not just a small sort of group of the marginalized conflict resolution people as it used to be before. Now these are very popular personalities, each of whom have a quite big number of uh, electorate and constituencies. And they say, we don't need moderators. We don't need Russia, first of all. They say we don't need Russia. And they even say we don't need the Western mediators because they bring in their own uh, co confrontations. Their problem, EU brings their problem with uh, Turkey. So it adds to the uh, confrontation and tension. Uh, it brings some, you know, civilizational um, sort of uh, prejudices and things like that. So I think there is a very strong uh, and uh, positive trend coming below. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Leila, also for saying that uh, this can also be problematic, this geopoliticization, so that it should also be 
broker like between between the conflicting parties in this sense. Um, Mithat, there is a question for you and, and someone asked that I would like to hear uh, comments on what be the role of Syrian mercenaries in this new balance of power, as you called it. And he also says that strangely after the November agreement, this is an issue that remains left out, but it bears potentially very negative impacts for the region in the future. And maybe adding to that, because we also got um, um, uh, in the chat uh, someone asking, it should also have been interesting also to have like a little bit uh, more on the role of Iran. So maybe maybe you can also um, um, try at least, uh, there's no Iranian here today, but, but maybe you can also also bring in a little bit like what, what, what role does Iran play, probably also to Azerbaijan and peace. Yeah, 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 Stephanie, I would like to start to say that I agree with Leila. What the, the, if the, there will be a kind of a solution, it must be uh, rise from the region itself. And the regional actors, especially Armenians and Azerbaijanis, think twice to, to resolve this issue. Maybe this is the reason why there is no ideal resolution of this, this issue at that moment, because militarily, Parties did what they did up until that uh, point, and beyond this level is a kind of a, a catastrophic development, most probably for the future of both nations and the Caucasus as well, as well as the other parties involved, including Russia and Turkey. Therefore, uh, the regional people, especially Armenian side, needs to think twice, and they have to get together. And this, there is no ideal resolution. I said why? Because you know this is the point that Sergei raised. Uh, the status issue, for example, the status issue, status is totally different for each and every party. They think dependent, independent of each other and they have no common or joint uh, even points to start with. And this was the reason why we have uh, a, a kind of a Karaba issue for a long while, for almost three decades, because parties think and look at the issue from a different perspective. And when they get together to discuss those issues on the table to negotiate for the uh, ideal resolution, then the c conclusion comes most of the time, there's no ideal resolution at all. But what we are in need, is, in need of is to, to active uh, involvement of all those parties and transaction between uh, the people on, on the spot uh, from Karabakh to, uh, let me say, uh, Nakhchivan or Turkey to uh, Iran, from Russia to uh, of course, Georgia, this is a kind of an involvement. And for the uh, this mercenaries issues, I think it's a kind of an exaggeration. Most probably there is no concrete clues of the, the involvement. And it seems that both Azerbaijan and, and Turkey, of course, they, don't, they do not need to use such a kind of or amount of mercenaries uh, on, on, on the field. There must be, there, there, there is a new tradition, in fact, in different regions, in Libya, in Syria, in maybe Nogorno Karabakh, to use some some mercenaries against the other adversary, and this is the case for some some people to to come to the the, the, the area of fight or the field, in fact, to uh, to to marginal marginalize the, the 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 spot, in fact. But what Turkey did is much more important than using those mercenaries in an effective way. Because, you know, as I said, what Turkey did in Azerbaijan is to have a new kind of an army from scratch almost. And it is it was NATO cons connection. Uh, it was Turkey's Western connection to have Turkey to, 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 to train and create a kind of a modern army in, 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 in Azerbaijan how to use those technology, drone technology, whatsoever. These are the much more important aspects of Turkey's involvement in the region. Uh, for Azerbaijan to use those kind of tools in their hands, such as mercenaries or the, or the other kind of uh, topics is, is a headache. What, what we uh, witnessed in 1990s, and Sergei wrote many articles on it, what happened in, in Chechnya and the North Caucasus using those mercenaries or radical elements backfired to those countries who tried to use those uh, units. Therefore, I don't think that they Turkey used in a, in a much broader perspective. And this is a kind of an exaggeration uh, from the, the, that point of view. Uh, being a kind of a, an authoritarianism, democracy, uh, those elections and the environment, political environment, not only in the Caucasus, but in Turkey, uh, from this perspective is not promising. I have to accept it. But what will happen in the near future, most probably after this COVID uh, way, 
uh, we will or the people may find some ways and means to normalize their life for the better future for themselves. This is the key point uh, for the Caucasus. Uh, again, I don't say that there is no room for the West or Europeans or Americans in the Caucasus or in other regions from the Black Sea to the Middle East. There is a room. This is the reason why the reconstruction, the normalization or the people-to-people -people relations, uh, confidence building measures, they are all necessitates international involvement and the EU especially have a kind of, of know-how and, and huge baggage and experience to, to export towards the region. Most probably this is going to be much more welcomed by the uh, people of the Caucasus as well as uh, Turkey and Russia as well. Thank you very much, uh, Mithat. Uh, we're also mm, coming into the finishing line and there is one uh, more question which I would uh, like to raise and then you can also uh, probably, whoever wants to start, uh, also finish with this question, the same question for everyone uh, with his last words uh, for today, of course. Uh, um, and the question is like, what do actually other countries gain um, like, for example, that Israel kept its stance with Azerbaijan and after the confrontation, it gained a military air base from Azerbaijan next to Iran. So what will other countries gain which helped both sides militarily, politically and or economically? That would be the last question. Uh, who would like to, to start? Just maybe a just short uh, word. Maybe Leila and Sergei also add to this discussion. And Azerbaijan is very careful when the Iran has concerned, politically and for the other reasons. Therefore, there is no need to alienate uh, Iran from Azerbaijani perspective. And during the second uh, Nogorno-Karabakh war, or what happened last couple of months, uh, Iran, for the first time, stayed a kind of a not neutral on this issue. They, had, they, they were very careful on both parties and tried to uh, protect their distance from the issue and they defended Azerbaijan's territorial integrity, but on the other hand, they just say, they would like to keep their relations with uh, Iran as well. Therefore, uh, Azerbaijan most probably tried to keep its contacts and relations with Israel because of the infrastructure they are in need of, uh, but do not like to uh, alienate, alienate uh, Iranians in, in its, its future. This may be the, 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 my comment. Leila, you want to add or Sergey? No. Sergey, so, you want to add something? I can. I uh, can I repeat what I said previously, because the question was about uh, the role of actors for both conflict in Paris. Uh, let me uh, repeat that Russia uh, was the dominant uh, force who stopped the uh, warfare. It's, uh, it's undeniable. It's acceptable, even for uh, other two uh, co-chairs of Minsk OSD group. And that idea is uh, Moscow summit in January when Russia just proposed the uh, restoration of infrastructure, a revitalization of uh, economic transportation ties as a chance how to resolve the conflict potentially. I'm not so naive to believe that everything will be realized immediately, but nevertheless, it, it's a chance, not offered by other actors. Thank you. Before I go, I'll give the floor to Dimitrios. Do you want to add something else uh, which was not mentioned yet? Or No, no. Uh, I think it's this was a, <clears throat> a wonderful discussion. I'm glad that uh, all these friends and colleagues uh, are with uh, with us. I mean, meet that we, we live and work in the same town, in the same university. We hardly see each other, even though today, earlier, and that's why I joined you guys late, uh, we were in another webinar, and this was about Greece and Turkey and Eastern Mediterranean. And I think it's very interesting as a Greek listening. I mean, I, I do study the region, the Black Sea region, but from a Greek perspective, it was interesting because there's a lot of talk in Greece also about the linkages. And I think there is a condominium, an arc between the Black Sea, the greater Black Sea, the Eastern Mediterranean, the Middle East. And, and from your comments, especially Sergei's, we are talking about an arc from the other side as well. So connecting connecting the Black Sea region to the Middle East via Iran. So it's on the other side of Turkey, which is also very interesting in that sense uh, and, and how how this reality is being panned out. But, but um, and I think also very, very interesting about um, the position, I think uh, Richard, Leila and others mentioned also about uh, 
their attempts, in particular Leila mentioned, of Azeris and Armenians trying to reach out to each other and maybe not wanting, not wanting necessarily the West or Western involvement because that creates a number, a whole bunch of other issues. Uh, and, and also the fact of the three Eurasian uh, powers that uh, have an ambivalent relationship with the West. And, and this is a reality also. So I'm uh, glad uh, that uh, we did this event. This is the first part of our joint series with, uh, the, between the CIS and the International Institute for Peace uh, on the greater um, struggle for, for the Black Sea region. And uh, we look forward to doing our next one, I think, on the 25th of March on uh, shared and conflicting interests in the Black Sea region, uh, where um, we'll be soon announcing the speakers. I think we already have uh, uh, Dimitri Trenin, who will be joining us, and Hannah Celeste uh, from Ukraine. And we have a couple of other speakers, but uh, we will announce them as soon as we get full confirmation from Georgia and Moldova. And I think it's going to be another interesting debate. So thank you for this. Thank you, Stephanie, for the cooperation. And the floor is back to you. Thank you so much. I would say we can finish here. So thank you so much for all your participation. Thanks to the, the participants as well. It was very interesting. We talked about geopolitical implications. We talked about that also the humanitarian situation was mentioned by Leila. And I think it's important. Russian interest in security of its neighborhood, but also Turkish interest. Um, um, so thank you very much. Um, I hope to see you soon all together and um, enjoy your evening and uh, stay healthy, which, which is what we need to say these days, unfortunately, but I'm pretty sure that at one point we will manage to see each, us, uh, each uh, at us again in person. So thanks a lot and enjoy Thank your you. evening. Thanks Thank so you. much. Bye. 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 Thank you.